let's say. And also, of course, whatever we'll be discussing in today's class. But that's essentially meant to clarify whatever was discussed before. It's a short exam, so it's really not going to be very extensive. And I will try to keep the question small. But now, if you have any questions, you need any clarifications, please go ahead. For short exams, as in it is 90 minutes, right? Yeah, that's a short exam. Not a three hour exam, that is, or a two hour exam. I don't know, is it 90 minutes or is it one hour? What is the schedule? So actually, we have to, we don't have any extra time to uh, scan and upload. So it has to be slightly under 90 minutes. Yeah, so 90 minutes yeah. essentially means that I'm going to set a question for around one hour, 10 minutes or so. Yes, sir. And then the rest of the time you get to scan and upload. Yes, sir. Okay, now questions. Done? Everybody is very clear about everything that was discussed? Wow. Two days before the exam, nobody has any questions. That's great. No, sir. Actually, uh, at least I, I couldn't go through the last uh, lecture. Sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly. Could you just repeat that? I mean, I, I haven't seen the last lecture. I, I couldn't see. Still not clear. I mean, I, I'm saying I haven't seen the last lecture. As in 11, lecture 11. You should have. Yes, 11 sir. was up quite a long time ago. Yes, sir. So I'm not going to put 12 in the exam, but 11 definitely will be in. And, well, I would have loved to put 12 also in because that would have rounded off us part of the course. But anyway, doesn't really matter. It's the is just a ritual anyway. So... Sir, can you discuss the uh, class test question? Uh, the uh, number of classes of S4 and uh, how many elements in each class, that question. Sorry, could you just hold on. Let me just change my network because I seems I am getting a lot of trouble hearing you. It may not be my problem, but still. So I will leave and come back. Yes, can you now repeat the question? Uh, sir, uh, could you discuss the class test question? Uh, uh, the number of classes of uh, S4 and... Uh, number of classes of S4. And how many okay. elements in each class. Right. So, basically, we did talk about one particular aspect, which was the cycle structure decides which class and element of a permutation group belongs to, right? So, say, if I have a permutation like this, and another permutation like this, by the way, very often we so don't even we write can't see your part. screen. Oh, you oh, sorry, I forgot to present. Thank you. Let me just present it first. Okay, so if we have these two permutations, let's call them sigma 1 and sigma 2. You can see the screen now, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Now, very often we will, when we know the number of elements in the group, let's say we are talking of S4, so we know that we are talking of permutations of four objects. Very often we will not write sigma 2 as 
this, we will just write this. And what that tells us is that the thing which is not being mentioned simply doesn't move around. That stays where it is. So one cycles are often not written. That's just a standard convention. Now, these two are not in the same class. How do we know that? We, we know that basically because of the fact that pi sigma pi inverse, whenever given any permutation sigma, if you did pi sigma pi inverse, this has the same cycle structure as sigma. So basically, things with the same cycle structure go together. When I say cycle structure, I mean the size and number of cycle, cycles of every size. So basically, if I'm talking of S4, what kind of cycle structure can you have? You can have a 4 cycle. Okay. When I say 4 equals 4, that of course is a trivial statement. What I really mean here is, the thing on the left is how many elements you have. And this is the cycle structure. You have four elements in one cycle, no, no other cycles. Then you can have three plus one. Three elements, one, three cycle, one, one cycle. Right? So one, four cycle here, one, three cycle, one, and one, one cycle. There is an example like this. Of course, a four cycle would be something like this. This is an, this is an example of a four cycle. What I wrote a while ago, this one is an example of a three plus one cycle. Now, then you could have a 2 plus 2 cycle, that is 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's an example. A 2, 2, a two, a 2, 2 cycles, then you could have, could have a 2, 1 and a 1, that is something like 1, 2 and 3 doesn't move, 4 doesn't move. Then you could finally have this, which is of course, Nothing but this. Okay. So these are just examples. These are not all the possibilities, but these are just examples of the various uh, permutations which have this given cycle structure. Now, every, every permutation which has the same cycle structure has to belong to the same class. So the number of classes is simply equal to the number of different possible cycle structures. So how many possibilities are there? As you can see, there are only one, two, three, four, five possibilities. So, five classes. Okay. So, that's answer number one. How many classes? Five classes because the number four can be, can be broken up into five such partitions. Is that clear to everybody? Now, how to calculate the partition for a large, suppose SN, we are talking of SN and N is some large integer, then how to calculate the partition for that is a rather non-trivial problem. But for a small integer, like 4 or 5, it's pretty easy to list down all the partitions. Straightforward. Okay? Clear? And every partition corresponds to a given cycle structure, and every cycle structure corresponds to a class. Is this okay with everybody? Yes. yes. So if I ask the question, like, yeah, is there a confusion about this? Just tell me that. Uh, yeah, so I, I knew the result because you had explicitly stated it in the lecture video also, but I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't really understand how you showed it. I did not understand why you were acting that pi sigma pi inverse on sigma i. Like, why, why shouldn't it directly i act on an i, which is just any... Say, I wasn't, I, okay, that was sigma pi sigma inverse. That was what I was ap applying on sigma i. Right? So there the base permutation was pi and the conjugate permutation was sigma pi sigma inverse. So all elements in the conjugacy class of pi would be permutations like this sigma pi sigma inverse. The sigma belongs to SN. Any permutation, right? That's what that that anyway is what a conjugacy class is for any any group small g capital G. The conjugacy class of an element small g is just given by g prime g g prime inverse for g prime belonging to capital G, 
right? Now, the question that I was trying to ask is what, what exactly are these elements? What are sigma pi, sigma inverse? Okay. And to answer that, what you really need to see is what does sigma pi, sigma inverse do to the numbers 1, 2, 3 up to n? Okay. So when you were asking that, so what, so of course, what we want to know is what does sigma pi, sigma inverse do to a particular element i, right? And that is the map that we want. But at the same time, if you look at a permutation like this, let me just write the permutation, the two row formalism, let's say one, two, three, four is two, one, four, three. Okay. Now this particular version, it tells me that one goes to two, two goes to one, three goes to four, four goes to three, right? And that's a complete characterization of what this particular permutation is. But if instead of saying that, I told you 3, 4, 1, 2 is 4, 3, 2, 1. Would you or would you not agree that these are the same permutations? Yeah, they are. Right. So I don't really have to tell you what happens to I as long as I can tell you what happens to every element. I'm done. Right. That is, yeah. It doesn't have to come in the order 1, 2, 3, 4. It can come in any other order as long as I've told you what happens to a particular element. Then I'm then I'm done with done with specifying exactly what this permutation is. Right? You agree? Uh, yes, sir. But the i doesn't... Uh, I thought the i represents any element, right? Like it, uh, it doesn't... I here represents 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? These numbers. Okay. Okay. okay? So now instead of saying that, now the point is, if instead of saying that I tell you what happens to sigma i, I've also told you exactly what sigma pi sigma inverse does. Except, you have to be careful about one thing. The important thing is the permutation is after all a function, right? It's So you know the formal definition of permutation of n objects really is nothing but a one-to-one -one onto map that is a bijection from a from a finite set to itself right yeah so in order to specify what that function is you have to tell me exactly what happens to every one of the elements right now the question is if i tell you what happens to sigma i for all i have i told you what happens to every one of the elements Yes or no? Yeah, yes. Because sigma i runs because as i runs over the entire set, sigma i also runs over the entire set in some other order. But if yeah, I tell yeah, you what yeah. happens to sigma i, I've told you everything, right? That's so telling what first of all, telling what happens to sigma i is equivalent to telling what happens to i. Is that okay? It has the same amount of information. The only thing that you need to specify when you want to specify a function. Is that when the function apply, acts on every element of the domain, what element of the range do you get? That's, that has nothing to do with group theory. That's basically the definition of what a function is. So if it so happened, for example, that sigma i took only two values, let's say, if you are possible, that sigma i only took the values 1 and 2, as i ran over 1, 2, 3, 4, if this were possible, then of course this would not make sense because then I will only have to, would only have told you what happens to one and two, but what I really need to tell you is what happens to one, two, three, and four. But since sigma is also a permutation, hence it's a one-to-one -one onto map, as i runs over the entire set, one, two, three up to n, sigma i also runs over the entire set. So specifying this does not lose you information. It's as good a characterization of the permutation as saying what happens to i. That's the first point. The second point is, of course, why would I want to look at sigma i? I for example, I'm not trying to look at sigma. what happens to sigma tilde i where sigma tilde is some other permutation, right? The reason why I'm looking at sigma i in particular, of course, is that the structure here makes it easy to see that this is going to be sigma of pi i. Right? So what does uh, this sigma pi sigma inverse do? It moves sigma i to sigma of pi i, right? Yeah. But and this all automatically makes it obvious that if you had a structure like this, say one, two, three, 
and 4. So this was not this one. This is a different permutation. Uh, let's say I have a permutation like this. This is your pi. And let's say sigma is this, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then I can calculate what sigma pi sigma inverse is by making it act on 1, 2, 3, and 4 sub in succession. On the other hand, I can equally easily find out what this is by saying, okay, let's take sigma i and what does pi do? Pi moves 1 to 2. What does sigma pi sigma inverse do? It will move sigma 1 to sigma 2. And just like pi moves sigma 2 to sigma 3, pi moves 2 to 3, sigma pi sigma inverse will move sigma 2 to sigma 3. That's exactly what this statement really says. Sigma pi sigma inverse just to sigma i, what pi essentially would have done. To, and then apply sigma of that. Or if you just want to look at this explicitly, what will this do? Under pi, 1 goes to 2. Under sigma pi sigma inverse, sigma 1 goes to sigma 2. But what is sigma 1? Sigma 1 is 2. Right? Oh. And sigma 1 goes to sigma 2. Right? Because 1 goes to 2 under pi, sigma 1 goes to sigma 2 under this. So sigma 2, of course, is 1. So, and But then, your 2 goes to sigma 2, pi goes to 2, pi makes 2 go to 3. Sigma pi sigma inverse makes sigma 2, which is 1, go to sigma 3. What is sigma 3? That's 4. Okay? And pi makes 4 sit where it is. Sigma pi sigma inverse will make sigma 4 sit where it is. And what is sigma 4? That's 3. So this is what sigma pi sigma inverse is. Okay? Yes, sir. But now, what is the important thing in this proof? Not the actual value of sigma pi sigma inverse may be useful for some specific calculation, but it's really not the major thing that is of interest to us here. The major thing that is of interest to us in this particular case is simply this. Whatever cycle structure pi has, this should make it obvious that sigma pi sigma inverse must have the same cycle structure. Here, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1. That's what this cycle structure is. And what sigma pi sigma inverse does is sigma 1 goes to sigma 2, that goes to sigma 3, and sigma 3 goes to sigma 1. And sigma 4, 4 stays sigma 4. This is what sigma pi sigma inverse really is. Right? I don't care what permutation sigma is. Of course, if sigma is specifically 1, 2, and 3, 4, then sigma pi sigma inverse will be this one. But whatever sigma pi sigma sigma is, sigma pi sigma inverse will always be sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 in a cycle and sigma 4 in another cycle. So you will always have a 3 cycle and a 1 cycle. That will not change no matter what sigma is. Okay? Is this clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that, is, that is the explanation as to why. So I was not looking at sigma i because I wanted to look at what exactly the output is going to be. What exactly this permutation is going to be. Of course, I could... If I wanted to find out sigma pi sigma inverse, that's the easiest way. But much, much more importantly for me, this actually goes and shows that sigma pi sigma inverse must have the same cycle structure as pi has. And consequently, and in, uh, conversely, suppose I have another pi prime, which is 3, 1, 2, and 4. Or okay, 3, 1, 4, and 2, let's say. Okay. Can I find the sigma? Says that pi prime will be sigma pi sigma inverse. So there are two questions here. One is, I've already established that if pi has a particular cycle structure, sigma pi sigma inverse must have the same cycle structure. The other question, the converse is, if pi and pi prime have the same cycle structure, then is pi prime of the form sigma pi sigma inverse for some sigma? You should realize that these are two different questions. The answer to the first one, of course, is yes. That is, if pi and sigma pi sigma in, so for a, any sigma, pi and sigma pi sigma inverse must have the same cycle structure. But the answer to this question is also pretty straightforward. Pi prime 3, 1, 4, 2, right? But 3, that means that if, I, if pi prime were sigma pi sigma inverse, if this were correct, then 3 would have to be sigma 2, 
Okay, that's really wrong, but uh, let me just continue with this. If sigma is this, then sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 4, sigma. If sigma actually is such that sigma 2 is 3, and sigma 1 is 1, sigma 4 is 4, and sigma 3 is 2, then sigma pi sigma inverse will be this pi prime. Okay? Is that okay? Yes, sir. But is this the only sigma which will give you this pipe right? When I said my statement is not correct, I what I was referring to, I said then sigma has to be this. The sigma 2 is 3, sigma 1 is 1, sigma 4 is 4. Does this have does this have to be correct? Yes. Okay, let's write this one, four, three, two. Is this a different permutation? This is again a permutation to the same cycle structure three and one. But is this a different permutation from pi prime? No, it's the, it's the same one. It's the same permutation, right? Yeah. So instead of sigma 2 being 3, sigma 1 being 1, sigma 4 being 4, and sigma 3 being 2, if you had a different sigma, for which sigma 2 is 1, sigma 1 is 4, sigma 4 is 3, and sigma 3 is 2, even then you would have the same final sigma pi sigma inverse. Right? Yeah. So there would be multiple sigmas in general, which will connect pi to pi prime. And that's always possible. That usually always happens. Right? When two elements G and G prime of a group capital G are conjugate to each other, what that means is there has to be some element, let's call that say H in capital G, such that H, G, H inverse is G prime. But when I say there has to be some element, I don't mean that there is one element. There would usually be much more than one element. Okay? Many more. And here, there are many more. So, any confusions about this from anybody else so far? Yes? Okay, if not, then, then next, let's move on to the next question. How many elements? This is how many classes do you have? Okay. 2 plus 2. So all the partitions will correspond to a class. And here I can easily see. Okay. I hope there are four, five possible classes. How many elements to each class? That was the next question. So let's tackle the easiest one. How many elements to this class? All four elements in a four cycle. How many possible elements can you have? Okay, the easiest one is this one. How many cycles can you have here? How many permutations can you have here? For one plus one plus one plus one. Okay, if you are typing something, I will have to check. Pratik is saying 3 factorial. While I agree, I would want to know why. I do agree. But that was the answer to this one. What is the answer to this one? How many permutations do you have here? One. 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 Yeah, there's only one per possible permutation, right? The only possible permutation is here is 1 stays 1, 2 stays 2, 3 stays 3, 4 stays 4. No, possi no further possibilities. Okay, how many here? Pratik has said it's 3 factorial or 6. How would you justify that? There are actually several ways of justifying this. In fact, I actually talked about how many elements in the discussion class. And I gave you a formula for this.
the badika is your mic not working if it's working can you just speak up and tell me why, how you got the refractorium okay he is saying permutations of four objects in a circle which is great if you understand what that means where is the circle here for example he is right of course but i want to know when you say circle what do you mean by the circle or is everybody sure they have understood if if so then i can of course move on and forget about this the rest of the question but then i'm pretty sure you should be able to figure it out well actually let's do a bigger one let's say i have a particular permutation which has a five cycle the two five cycles of course that can't be for s4 this has to be for a bigger group and say three two cycles and four one cycles let's say so these two three four are number of each cycles and these are the sizes of the cycle so which group are we talking about here s what oh could you repeat uh i mean oh. so far there are two five cycles three two cycles and four one cycles so this these are the so these are the cycle sizes so this this is of course s20 That's easy to see. That's just the, how many objects are we talking about? Two five cycles. That's ten objects. Six objects here and four more objects here. So S. So I'm talking of the permutation of twenty objects. I'm talking of a specific kind of permutation. The permutation which has two five cycles, uh, three two cycles, and four one cycles. Okay. And now the question that I have for you is. all cycles which have the same size all permutations with this cycle structure will be in the same class so question what exactly how many such such permutations are there and there's one there are several ways of answering this but if you think about it you have these two five cycles two patches with five dots everywhere then you have three two cycles and then you have four one cycles so 20 objects in all so one way of figuring out how many such permutations are there would simply be to figure out how many ways i can permute the 20 objects which of course is 20 factorial and then divide them by permutations which will not make a difference do you get my point there are permutations which actually will will permutations of these 20 labels so there are labels here right so one of the, one would be simply 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, so there is one permutation, which of course there is one, two, three, four, five are in a cycle. So one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to five, five goes back to one, and so on. If I do a permutation of the numbers here, any arbitrary permutation, I can do that in twenty factorial ways. that will of course give rise to a uh, another permutation with the same cycle structure if i just permute the numbers from here okay but what will happen of course is that many of them are actually the same permutation so just uh, for a shorter smaller thing with the s4 this with this four element permutation for four cycle i can of course permute it in 24 ways the 1 2 3 4 labels but these 24 ways will not necessarily give rise to 24 different 
permutations, right? Some of them will give you the same permutation. So the question is, which ones will give you the same permutation? You have to find out how many, how many of these permutations will not, how many of the, okay, these are different, okay, there are too many permutations I'm talking about, that may be a bit confusing. This is a particular permutation which has a cycle structure. Then let us permute the labels, and I'm now referring to the permutation of the labels. Hello? I mean, class, I mean, to a class, I mean, to a class, Okay, so if I just ex wrote this explicitly, if I permuted the labels around, I would get this also as a cycle. Would this be different? No, it's the same. You can shift any element, say n minus one times, and it will be the same. Uh, Cycle. n minus 1 times are you sure of that how many possible possible permutations will give you the same value if i so what do you what do you mean is this is the same permutation as this one right so how many choices do i have like this on the other hand this one is a different permutation right do you agree yeah it's different but this and this they are the same permutation, right? Yeah. So how many different, each one of these, one, two, three, four, for example, how many identical permutations do I get just by shifting things around? Four. Four, four because basically I have a choice of what, which one to put at the beginning. If you're putting one at the beginning, I can put two, or I can put three, or I can put four. Any one of these, once I choose the first element, as long as I'm not changing the permutation proper, the moment I choose the first element in the cycle, the rest fall in place, right? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I meant like if you shift it n minus one times each element, you would get three other things. So including Actually, the first not n minus one times, n times. Uh, yeah, but yeah, like you if you start from one, 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 yeah. Okay, and and this one, right. So n actually there are n possibilities. You can shift yeah. it n minus one time, you're right. But if you include the original one, it's actually n possible shifts which give you the same thing. Which is why actually out of the four factorial possible permutations you could do, each one of the distinct permutations actually occur only four factorial by four times. That's another way of seeing that this is going to be three factorial or six in number. Okay, so these are look in permutation or combinations. You must have seen that before in class twelve. There are many different ways of arguing about the same result. Instead of this uh, argument that Pratik gave is perfectly right. That was the number of ways you you could permute four things in a cycle. In a cycle, He's, of course, he was saying circle because that's what you would learn in class twelve. If you put four objects around a circle, how many different permutations can you have? But a cycle essentially means the same thing, right? Because one, two, three, four, and then you're back to one. So it's really sort of like you have, you have put the whole thing on a circle. Now that's one way of arguing that. The other way of arguing that is what I've just given you. You can permute the labels in four factorial ways, but out of them, four, for every possible permutation, there are four which are actually identical. So if you go by the same argument here, can you tell me what will I put down here? What will I divide this by? Twenty factorial permute possible permutations, right, of the labels. But of course, all these twenty factorial permutations do not change the particular permutation I'm talking about. So you have to divide the whole thing by five square into two cube. Okay, so that's a good starting point. What he's saying is I have to divide it by five square. Oh, let's be, let's be very 
pedantic and write it every write everything down two fives and two cube because there are two possibilities here two into two into two and of course you should also divide by four ones which you did not mention simply because it will not make any changes but is that all Uh, no, uh, so I think we also have to take into account of. Do we have to take into account changing the order of the five cycles that we are doing? So the you five cycles me. themselves can be permuted in two factorial ways and uh, two ways and then three factors. So what you are suggesting is you have another two factorial and three factorial. Why? Because simply because this particular permutation, for example. Where one, two, three, four, five has not been shifted among themselves, not at all. One, two, three, four, five has changed to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and six, nine, seven, eight, nine, ten has changed to one, two, three, four, five, an entirely different permutation of the labels. But this also gives you the same thing, right? It doesn't matter which cycle you write first and which cycle you write next; you get the same permutation anyway. Is everybody clear about this? So since there are two five cycles here, there are two factorial ways of permuting the five cycles themselves around, and there are three two cycles, and there are three three factorial ways of permuting them around. And those will not actually change the actual permutation that you are talking about. So when you want to find out how many permutations there are in the class, that means there are with a particular cycle structure. What you have to do is you have to take the total number of possible permutation of labels, divide by those permutations, by the number of those permutations which do not change anything, and the rule so is simple. We may yeah. have, we may have to include one more four cycle because we have taken twenty factorial. The order of the one cycles will also matter. Order of the one cycles will also matter, will it? Because we are taking twenty factorial, right? Yeah. So if I have Right now, you've written seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. If I switch those labels around, exactly, those are counted so, separately in twenty-five. Perfectly, but... perfect. That's an extra four factorial in the denominator. Which is actually why I insisted on writing the one into one into one into one. That didn't make a difference. But the fact that there are four one cycles, so instead of seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, if we have twenty, eighteen, nineteen, seventeen, where these four objects get permitted among themselves. That of course makes no difference. It's still telling you twenty states, twenty seventeen states, seventeen eighteen states, eighteen nineteen states, nineteen. As the original was once doing, right? So, is there any confusion about this? So, the rule is simply this: you have to divide n factorial by the size of the cycle to the power number of the cycles. That's five for this, five for this. So, five square, two cube, one to the four. Okay. In addition to that, you have to have factorials of the number of one cycles, number of two cycles, number of three cycles, number of four cycles, number of five cycles, etc. Of course, if there is no, for example, here there are no three cycles, so number of three cycles is zero. Thankfully, zero factorial by definition is one, so it doesn't matter. Okay, let me just show you an explicit calculation that for the case that I asked for. So, how many permutations here? The answer is four factorial divided by four objects. So, one four cycle, four to the power one, and The number of ways you can permute one object among each other, one factorial. Of course, nobody really needs to write the power here or the fact one factorial here. I'm just doing that to sort of illustrate the general formula. So that's six. Then here you have four factorial, three to the power one times one factorial. So one three cycle, that's the one. That's where the one factorial coming from, and one one cycle, that's of course one to the one 
That is one factor. With some taxes, you will never write these things anyway. So that's 24 by 3, that's 8 such permutations. 2 plus 2 and 2? Well, this is where you get 4, four factorial divided by. Okay, tell me what this is going to be. Four labels which can permute among themselves. So by you... two cube. Uh, so two into two into two. Uh, well, two cube is right technically, but you should not say two cube. You should just say two square and two factorial. Yeah. Right. I hope everybody recognizes why I'm saying two square into two factorial rather than two cube. Well, while they're the same number, they mean two entirely different things. These two squares are simply because there's a factor of two. Coming from here, that's because I could write this as 1, 2 or 2, 1, and this one as 3, 4 or 4, 3. So that's four, a factor of 2 from here, a factor of 2 from here. And because I could swap these two around, that can be done in two factorial ways. So 4 factorial divided by 2. There's only one 2 cycle. That's 2. A division by two and of course there's only one two cycle so you can only permute that among itself in only one times but there's something more which goes in the denominator which is two factorial for the one cycles two factorial for the one cycles exactly so that's 24 divided by four that's six so how many have we got so far 14 17 23 which is great because you have already figured out that this is 1. But that's 4 factorial. By our law, that's 4 factorial into 1 to the 4 by 4 factorial. So that, of course, is 1. And why is that great? Because now you add all these numbers together. 6 plus 8, 14 plus 3, 17 plus 6, 23 plus 1, 24. That exactly is 24 group elements, which the entire group S4 has. So S4 has 5 Conjugacy classes, one corresponding to each partition of the number 4. And is the partition, which essentially tells you how many cycles you have, or what length, which actually tells you just by simple combinatorics, how many elements are there in each conjugacy class. This information is going to be very, very critically important when we talk about the representation theory for the symmetric group, which is critically important actually for physics and maths. But uh, I'm pretty sure you can write down the general formula pretty, in a pretty straightforward manner. That is, if you have, uh, if, you have a, if you have a conjugacy class with n alpha, l alpha cycles, n alpha cycles of length k alpha, let's say. So, well, it's not n alpha cycles of length k alpha, that is, is really n one cycles of length k one, n two cycles of length k two, and so on. So, I mean, the entire Set, set it specified. Okay. Help me fill up the formula. You get one factor for each cycle length. So what is the factor that you get? K well, k alpha to the power n alpha, for three, say for one cycles, one to the power whatever, for two cycles, two to the power that number, into, is that okay? Yes. Now, 
of course you did not if you did not remember this we discussed all this in the class but if you did not remember that even then you should be able to just figure it out just this is small enough you could just figure it out by enumeration that would take a long time of course not very long but can be done if i had given you say s20 or something then you could then you would have no chance of working it out without knowing the formula by the way uh, although we have not formally defined irreducible or reducible representations yet actually we have that was in lecture 11 but we have not found out all these properties um we have still discussed the result in class that will tell you exactly how many irreducible representations s4 can have so all representations of s4 are built out of these building blocks which you call the irreps and how many irreps does s4 have i told you in a class exactly how many you would need or what the relationship is here what relationship will tell you this yes anybody remember that does anybody remember that yes or no number of conjugacy classes itself yeah it's exactly the same as the number of conjugacy classes that's the standard result that we will prove after the break after the mesem break that the number of irreps any group has any finite group has is always equal to the number of its conjugacy classes so here you have five irreps and i have also told you um how to figure out at least one way of figuring out the dimensions which is five irreps and the sum of the squares have to add up to how much squares of the sizes have to add up to order of the group order of the group so that has to add up to 24 in this case so if you can find out five positive integers whose squares add up to 24 and if that's the only possible choice then you are done of course once the group becomes large enough just this information may not be enough to tell you the only all the dimensions directly so for the in fact finding out all the irreps of sn is an immensely important task and we will devote some time to doing that or some we'll talk about at least two or three different techniques which will help you do that but uh, at least for small groups like this one with only 24 elements it should be sort of easy to figure out so five perfect squares which add up to 24 any guesses what that can be so largest possible size is of course five you cannot go beyond five or you can't even reach five right five square is already 25 that's more than 24 So can you see whether four is possible? Four square is sixteen, but that leaves how much? That leaves eight to be distributed among four other squares. There are four other squares which you have to put in here, which have to add up to eight. Is it possible to get that? No. How are you so sure? Is no. Of course, you can try all of them out, but can you give a quick argument as to why no? So I can't have a three square because that will make it nine already. Good, you can't and have a three square. Yeah, so if you have a two square, it come. Huh. So if I have uh, three two squares and one one square, that will make it nine as well. And any other combination of squares of two and twos and ones won't give me yeah, eight. But, yeah, true, true. But it's perhaps better to be a bit more systematic. You could say three square is out because the sum is eight, can't be nine. Two square that leaves you a sum of four for two of them. 
and you cannot have two squares which add up to four right because you just go by looking at the sums one after the other because then you can't have a two square here because that will not leave you anything for this fourth conjugacy class but you must have four non-zero sizes these are dimensions so two, this two square is out and that means of course so, yeah, yeah that means of course you cannot have a four dimensional representation you can only start with a three dimensional representation there are more systematic ways of getting this algorithmically out of a formula as we will derive later but for small groups even this kind of argument will work fine so three square is nine right that leaves you 15. So three but now you need three non-negative squares which add up to 15. so what will you put here you can use another three two two one so you can use another three that will give me nine more so six left four and i get six one one two square and two one square yeah You get two three squares, one two square, and two one squares. That adds up. That does, those are five positive integers which add up to two squares add up to twenty four. And if you can convince yourself that this is the only way you can get five positive squares whose sums add up to twenty four, apart from reordering. Re and that really means that the S, the group S four has these areps. It must have two one dimensional areps. One two dimensional array and two three dimensional array. By the way, when I say two three dimensional array, I of course am not counting equivalent array. The moment you have one representation, any representation similar to that is also an also a representation, right? And by the definition of array, it's obvious that if you have a array, any representation similar to that is also an array. There are infinitely many. So when we are saying there are two three-dimensional areps, what I mean is these two three-dimensional areps are inequivalent. It is part of my phone question. Is that okay? Okay. Any further questions? Something from even earlier round things which were covered before. Sir, this relationship between the conjugacy clauses and the irreps that you mentioned, is it true for all groups? Like it's uh, true for all finite groups, definitely. Okay. We'll prove that. It's actually also true for a larger class of groups, but it's not really true for all groups simply because enumeration would be a pop. If you have an infinite group, you may not be able to enumerate. But even for say infinite uh, Say, for example, for a group which has infinitely many conjugacy classes, saying that the number of edeps is equal to the number of conjugacy classes is really not that great a thing to do. However, for compact groups, we are going to define what they are when we talk of infinite groups. There is a you can what you can show is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between conjugacy classes and edeps. However, let me also point out that. This one-to-one -one correspondence simply for finite groups is simply usually simply is same number of elements, so it has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. But there is no canonical one-to-one -one correspondence. There's no natural way in which you can connect an irrep with a conjugacy class. Okay. It's a good, it's a standard result that we will prove that the number of conjugacy classes equals the number of irreps for finite groups, for all finite groups. However, and that means that you can always put them in one-to-one -one correspondence. As you all know, two sets which have the same number of elements can always be put in one-to-one -one correspondence. But usually there is no natural one-to-one -one correspondence between the classes on one hand and the edeps on the other. Apart from they're having the same number and that's it. However, for permutation groups, there is actually a very natural one-to-one -one correspondence between the classes, hence the partitions of the integer and the corresponding irrep which we, which is an important geometrical thing that we are going to talk about later but in general the result is true for all groups if for any finite group the number of classes equals the number of irreps 
The reason for that will be something we will see in, say, three or four classes. Three or four classes down the line. Either all the abstract stuff is over but already. We are already moving into concrete stuff when we are talking about representation theory. But right after the midterm break, we will start with something called the Great Orthogonality Theorem, which essentially helps us prove all the formulas that we will need to use group theory, at least for finite groups. Infinite groups, especially Lie groups, will take will require a slightly different approach. But uh, at least for most of the formula that formulas that we will need for finite group theory, as its application to physics, will be done in four or five more classes after this. At least, that, at least that's what I hope. So I say four or five classes, I mean four or five lecture videos. But all the previous stuff, that's okay. Because the abstract algebra group theory part is very much part of the course for the syllabus. Part of the syllabus for the mid -term. Sir, uh, can you explain the point care group once more, uh, like the proofs? I know the definition, but uh, that uh, is translation is a normal subgroup to point care and all those. OK. Mm. So basically, what we had in the Parker group, I hope this is clear to everybody, so I don't really need to repeat this, that the composition rule that we worked out was this. Is everybody cl clear about this thing? That this is the composition rule that you have when you yes, do sir. one Lorentz transformation plus a translation after another. OK, now, that there are two subgroups of this Parker group, which are rather obvious. Sorry. If you take this collection, for all allowed Lorentz transformations, this actually is isomorphic to the Lorentz group. We usually say this is the Lorentz group. Okay, and the isomorphism here is trivial. The Lorentz group, of course, is a collection. The actual Lorentz. Okay, let's call this L tilde for the time being. The actual Lorentz group is, of course, a collection of all four by four matrices, or it's basically in one to one correspondence with all four by four matrices which obey. this and then there's this other trans group let's say translation group or something isomorphic to the translation group which are members of the power category group elements which are sorry not zero but the null element or the identity element of the Lorentz group which is just the four by four identity matrix and then a translation right and the group of translations which essentially is in one to one correspondence with any four by one. So any four, all four vectors give you a translation, right? So just give me any column vector, four by one column vector that actually, or any set of four numbers, I got a translation. So this is the actual translation group. This is a subgroup of the Parker group. Remember all Parker group elements are pairs. You have one four by four matrix sitting here. And a uh, one by one or four by one column vector sitting here, right? If you just think in, in terms of these as matrices and column vectors. So when you talk of subgroups of the Poincare group, you have to talk about elements which belong to the Poincare group. That is why I'm not saying L is a subgroup. What I'm saying is L is actually isomorphic to L tilde. The isomorphism is obvious. And L tilde is a subgroup of the Poincare group. Similarly, T is isomorphic to this T tilde, and this curly T, curly T tilde is a subgroup of the Poincare group. Now, as I've already always stated, we don't really distinguish so much between groups which are isomorphic to each other. So we will often say 
Lorentz group is a subgroup of a Parker group. That's in fact what is always said. Nobody really says Lorentz group is isomorphic to a subgroup of the Parker group. Okay. We just say Lorentz group is. Now, having said that, uh, we want to show something like say the translation group is a normal subgroup of the Poincare group. So, how do we show that? We take an element from the translation group. Of course, what I really mean is this: this is the group T tilde, which is a normal subgroup. Or the Poincare group. That's what we mean. Okay. So how do we show that? I show that by taking an element, an arbitrary element, from the translation group, and conjugating that with any element from the Poincare group. Some lambda a, and then lambda a inverse. Okay, not a, or maybe I will call this this one lambda bar a bar. This is lambda bar a bar. Okay. And the question is, is this resulting thing a translation? So we take an arbitrary translation, conjugate that with any element for the Poir from the Poincare group, do you get a translation? If you do, then the set of all translations or the subgroup formed by all translations is a normal subgroup. Is this much clear to everybody? Yes, sir. OK, good. So now that we have this, now let's, let's calculate this. For that, all we need is the com composition rule and also the rule as to how to find out the inverse. So what is the inverse of lambda bar a bar? Anybody can tell me that? Lambda bar inverse and minus lambda bar into a. Lambda bar into a or minus lambda bar inverse into a? Into a. Okay, maybe let's drop the bar on top of the lambda anyway. We don't really need to distinguish that. So lambda inverse minus lambda inverse into what? A a bar. A bar. A bar. Okay, you should be able to understand why this is true even without doing the maths. What is the Poincare transformation? In the Poincare transformation, what you do is you do a Lorentz transformation first and then you translate. To invert, you have to translate back first by minus a bar and then do an inverse Lorentz transformation on that. But when you do an inverse transformation on the translated four vector, you're not only applying lambda inverse, you're also translating. But the translation is, of course, no longer minus a bar, it's my lambda inverse acting on minus a bar. Because you have inverted, you have applied the lambda inverse both on the x and the a bar. Anyway, so this is what you have. Now, let, now let's check. What do you get when you multiply this? When you multiply these two, you get lambda. And then you get lambda a plus a bar, right? Then you multiply these two. Is that okay with everybody? I just multiply the first two factors using the standard rule for power group. And then we are going to multiply these two. So what are you going to get? Yes? Your identity and... Uh... Well, identity and something here. By the way, I don't even really need to figure out what that something is. Right? You understand that? If all I want to show is that the translation group is a normal subgroup, what I need to show is take every element of the translation group, conjugate it with an arbitrary element of the Poincare group, and the result will be a translation. And what is a translation? A translation is a Poincare transformation where the Lorentz transformation part, the first part is the identity. So the moment you have established that this is I4, I don't really need to figure out what this is. Even without knowing what this is, I can tell you that this is some translation. So it's a member of the translation group. So you are done. So they have managed to show that basically this group of translations, the subgroup of translations is actually invariant under conjugation by every group element. Hence, it's a normal subgroup. Do you understand my point? Yes, 
Yes, sir. But can anybody tell me what this is? Though I don't really need what this is for that proof, but can you tell me what this is? It will be lambda a plus a bar minus a bar. So it will just. It will just be lambda a. Right? Is that okay with everybody? Yes, sir. So ultimately, it's a very rather simple result. You end up with if you conjugate a translation with any Parker group element, the result is a translation where the origin, which has just been where the translation vector has just been Lorentz transformed by whatever Parker group element you are using. But okay, can can we do the same thing with an arbitrary Lorentz element? Let's say let's take with lambda zero, and then do lambda. Okay, lambda bar is let's let's say L. The bar actually is getting into the way of writing the thing properly. Let's take any Lorentz group element of the form L a. Sorry, not Lorentz group. Any Parker group element of the form L a, and L a is inverse. And conjugate lambda zero with that, and let's check whether this is also going to be a Parker transformation, or sorry, a Lorentz transformation. That is, what we really need to check is whether this is zero. This stays zero after I do the conjugation. Well, that again is pretty straightforward. You can calculate this straight in a straightforward fashion. This is L lambda. You multiply these two together. What is this? A and what is this going to be? The translation. A. a. Plain a, right? L times zero, that's of course zero plus a, and then L of course is L inverse minus L inverse a. So now let's put them together. You get L lambda L inverse. Product of three lambda tra Lorentz transformations, of course a Lorentz transformation, no problem there. But what about this side? What do you get? L lambda L inverse. Hmm? What do you, do you get zero here first of all? Uh, not necessarily. What you get actually is it's a minus of l lambda l inverse. And since Lorentz transformations do not necessarily commute among each other, l lambda l inverse is can very well be non. Uh, even if they commuted, they would not really cancel out anyway. L lambda L inverse is usually not the identity. Might be for some special cases, but usually is not. So for a general Poincaré group element, if you conjugated a Lorentz transformation using any arbitrary Poincaré group element, you would usually not get a Lorentz transformation. You would get a Lorentz transformation and a translation, non-zero translation. Okay. By the way, at least one of the things that I aim to do by the time the course ends is to talk about the representations of the Parker group and sort of connect it with what kind of particles we have in the universe. At least that should be achievable within the time frame that we have left. And there you will see that these calculations that we have done so far here today, right now, are actually going to play an immense role in deciding what kind of, say, you know, also also in deciding things like uh, why don't uh, why say things like why do rotation rotations, uh, sorry, why do translations commute among each other, or why do, um, or rather, why do moment why do, rather. Why does why do translations commute among each other is a geometrical fact, but why do why does momentum commute among each other? On the other hand, why doesn't boost commute with momentum, and what exactly is the commutation relation? All that will follow from the, basically this kind of algebraic calculation that we have done here. Okay, this is just the geometry of Poincaré transformations, but it has an immense consequence in the long run about the nature of the universe even, about what kind of particles you can have. So we, I intend to at least do that by the time the course ends. 
and hopefully the way this is going, I should be able to finish that. Yes. Anything further? If there are no further questions, uh, best of luck for Wednesday's exam. And I will not be around on during the Wednesday exam, so don't expect any help from the teacher. But uh, hopefully the questions should be clear enough for you to be able to solve without any intervention from me. Okay. So this is the last chance that you will have to ask a question if you want to ask a question. Nobody seems to want to ask any questions, so we will call it a day today.